Hey, welcome to Whatcha Doin' with Brandon Horwin and Sophie Williams. And today's special guest is... My name is Richard J. Alexander. It's, uh, I'm flattered that you invited me today. Um, I've been in the business for 45 years, and uh, you're looking at somebody who all his dreams have come true and more. So uh, every day, every additional year, it's like icing on the cake. But I started out as a performer <clears throat> in the business, a singer, dancer, actor. And then I matriculated and started stage managing and then directing and then producing. So it's, um, uh, if you told me that I would have the career that I do, I wouldn't have believed it, you know, when I started and fell in love with theater at 10 years old. But the accomplishments speak for themselves. I'm a lot of fun to Google. <laughs> <laughs> There's tons of stuff there, uh, plenty of stars to look at, all of that. And, um, you know, every day you pinch yourself a little, like even just Cloris Leachman passing away in the past couple of days, you know, and remembering that I did a workshop of Great Expectations with her as Miss Havisham, like, you just realize, God, I like, I don't even remember all this stuff happening. Like, when did it all happen? How did I have the time? You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's all a mystery, but I wouldn't take back one chapter of it, I don't think. So that's who I am. I've matriculated, interestingly enough, um, you know, through Broadway and everything that, you know, now I've been named the Diva Whisperer, which is sort of hilarious. Uh, but I sort of like it. But uh, none of the people that I work with consider themselves divas. But, you know, with the um, hit list of stars that I've worked with, I think if you analyze the people that I work with, um, you know, everybody that I work with is a singing actor, you know, an actor who has an incredible voice. So they're not just singers, they're singers with power, with depth, with, you know, um, lyric, um, you know, storytelling, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, and I've worked with everybody I grew up admiring. So I missed the golden age by like 10 years, <clears throat> but I got to work with the golden age. So you know, that's been interesting. So during this quarantine that we've been in, um, you know, I have a whole wall of, of uh, vinyl albums here that are my youth and, you know, collecting and stuff like that. And I love my record player and my stereo. And I don't know, there's something about the needle and the record that's much better than compressed sound on CDs or streamed. And uh, so I'm just like a lit reliving my life, my career, um, um, broadening my understanding of musicals, trends, um, even I was talking to, do you guys know who Craig Burns is, the casting director from Telsey Casting? Yes. Yeah, so we're very, very good friends. And, you know, he used to hang out at our table at the flea market at Broadway Cares, but he loves theater and he's like the number one Les Mis fan in the world. Mm -hmm. and so we're very, very close, but we just started talking about the subway circuit of musicals, you know, back in the 40s, late 40s, and he had never heard of it. And I said, what do you mean you've never heard of it? And so we started Googling yesterday, but we couldn't find anything. So I went on Facebook, because I'm sort of a Facebook whore. And I put it out to the peeps and uh, everybody answered. And so now we're on that. And, you know, Shirley MacLaine was 15 and lied and said she was 18. So she could be, you know, in Oklahoma on tour picked by Roger. It's just, it's fascinating. But when you love it, you love it. You know, like some people have hobbies, they fish. They, I don't know what they do, but you know, I'm on <laughs> holiday. it's like, you know, books, you know, I can never read enough. I can never listen enough. I'm hungry. I'm a perennial student, you know, and it's 67 years old. Um, uh, you know, I know a lot. I don't know everything, but I know a lot. And that's sort of who I am. Nice. All right. Thank you so much. So you touched on this at the beginning, but you've basically worked in all aspects of theater going from performer to stage manager to directing to production so did you always set out to do this to explore all aspects of theater no, absolutely absolutely not you got to remember like you guys are going to enter um you know you're going to enter a mysterious workforce because we don't know <laughs> what the workforce is or when it's getting back however i did feel like with the class of 2020 i cried when i was watching the news every night and just all the special things that people did i think you guys are going to do something amazing i don't know what the next chapter is i really don't but i think there's something special waiting i think a lot of people like when i went into the business there were hundreds of us now there's thousands of you you know what i'm saying and talented because you know parents didn't want their kids to go into show business you know now they think maybe you can make a living yeah it's hard but so is nursing so is being a CPA, so is being a good lawyer. You know, what's not hard? Are you gonna like run away from your passion? And my dad was an educator and he knew it was important to be passionate. 
what happened in 1980 was a very uh, amazing moment. I took a directing class in college, just not that that matters, but the first thing I ever directed was The Fantastics in my sophomore year. I did a black box production <clears throat> and I liked it. I liked bossing people around, telling them what to do, you know, all that. And I have vision, like I see things, you know what I mean? It's crazy. This is why Barbara and I get along so well. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, when I did Amadeus, I was in the original Broadway cast with Ian McKellen and Tim Curry and Jane Seymour. And I was just a valet and an understudy, right? And, but it was a big deal doing this big production from the National Theater of Great Britain. <clears throat> and I had a friend who said, take the second ASM contract because there's an ASM, a first day, sorry, there's a stage manager, an ASM and a second ASM. And uh, you just collect valuables every night before the show, put them in the safe, hand them all out at the end of the show, but you get an extra $35 a week. But you also get to go to all the understudy rehearsals and watch, learn everything you can, and then try to direct the tours. And that's what I did. I got some really good advice and I ended up directing the tours of Amadeus. Then I did the Spanish language world premiere in Santiago, Chile. That production, the tour of the States played Canada, Cameron McIntosh saw it. You know, it all just, I don't know. It wasn't a plan, but when I did get the job, I was nervous about whether or not I could actually do it. And I remember, you know, we were at the Broadhurst and across the street was Sardi's and all the actors would eat at Sardi's because the menu was half price. And I saw Tommy Toon and we were friends and, you know, Tommy Toon was a performer and he's been, he had been directing. And so I said, Tommy, I got the job to direct the tours, around, but I don't know, I'm an actor. Like I was so confused. And he said in his Texas drawl, you know, Richard J, take the job. I couldn't get arrested after I won the Tony for Seesaw. And it wasn't until I directed the club. He goes, and you gotta know when a window opens. So this wasn't a time, there was no words like networking. It wasn't like one door opens, closes, another one opens. He said, you gotta know when the windows open, you know, to jump through it. And that's as raw as we were back then. And I took his advice and I remember, cause I remember reading about him in Vanity Fair magazine and it said he was a millionaire. And I said, wow, a millionaire from theater, you know? I couldn't even fathom this. And, um, you know, I don't know. So it was like, I don't know, it was, there was community, it was a club. Everybody knew everybody. You'd see Debbie Allen, you know, after the matinee of, you know, West Side Story. You'd see Elizabeth Taylor in the booth after Little Foxes. It was crazy and exciting. Absolutely. Um... So you've also been the resident director for the Chaplin Awards for film at the London Center. Mm -hmm. Lincoln Center, pardon Lincoln me. Center. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so how does directing an event like that, especially one of this you know, stature, differ from directing a large scale show or concert? It's really different. Lineups are a very special skill set. So whether it's a benefit, you know, like a lot of people put, oh, I worked with so-and-so and so-and-so. And they didn't really work with them. You know, I really work with all these people. Like I remember Billy Crystal going, are you giving me notes? And I said, yes, I am. And he goes, <laughs> and he was like playing with me, but I panicked for a minute. You know what I mean? And he goes, oh, okay. I thought you were, but you know, people will push your buttons. You know, I've worked with Scorsese, with De Niro, with Michael Douglas, uh, you know, with Catherine Deneuve, with Barbara, you know, lineups are fantastic, but you got to have your shit together. You got to know what you're doing. <clears throat> you have to have the vision. And you know, keep the focus on what it is you're raising funds for. It's fine to be entertaining, but you gotta be, it can't be people just dropping in doing what they do. It's gotta have purpose, you know what I mean? So with the Chaplin Awards, you know, these are uh, film careers. The most exciting part for me is, um, you know, I met the people at Lincoln Center because Barbara was being honored and they didn't even know I worked with her when, you know, I was being considered. And so I did, I guess, what was such a good job that they kept me on all these years. And it's one of the joys of my year is all the film people and Pedro Almodovar and, and uh, you know, even Vin Diesel, you know, like just chatting and hanging around and Michael Moore and it's dizzying, you know? And so the, the quality time, the quality time is in the rehearsal when they come to go over their scripts, we edit, we look at the teleprompters. That's the time you get you know, I won't say friendly, but that's the time where they're either buying you or they're not, you know what I mean? So you have to impress, you gotta be on your toes and you're on your feet all day and all night. So it switches from sneakers to Gucci boots. Then there's the event, then you're in the wings, then keeping it smooth, the pictures, the thing, signing the posters, you know, to put up for auction. It's a lot. 
But I have a great assistant who went to my alma mater. Somebody told me about him, a guy named Carlos Clemens who went to SUNY Oswego. And they go, this guy loves movies. He has his own TV show up here on campus. Anyway, he loved, I put him on all the film projects and I've cheated him into theater a little bit because I have three different assistants. And, uh, and you know, there he's in the corner singing with Meryl Streep and taking a picture. And I'm like, I don't even have a picture with Meryl Streep, you know? <laughs> but, you know, that's what it, because I'm doing my job, you know? So um, it's, it's a lot of fun. But Lincoln Center is one of the highlights of my life. And when the pandemic came, we were scheduled to, to do, um, to honor Spike Lee. Um, and of course, that has been postponed until, you know, we get back onto real life. But then just by, you know, a fluke, Norm Lewis, who I work with a lot and in concert, and I gave him his first job, you know, his first leading role in Miss Saigon. Um, he did the Five Bloods. And so, you know, hearing about Spike, you know, in Vietnam and, you know, we do what's going on. And that was the bed for the, you know, the movie. It, it's just funny the way life just keeps, you know, intertwining. But that's one of my favorite events of the year. It happens every spring. And it's a great reason to put on a tuxedo. Mm -hmm. I wear my watch that Barbara Streisand gave me for good luck. I always send her a video, you know, and, and they've just gone swimmingly, but the team up there is so great and they love movies and I love movies, but, um, you know, just putting together those packages and watching them and um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. So you started to touch on this about your time with Cameron McIntosh back um, few years oh, Macintosh years yes <laughs> and this also led into I think your um, time with Les Mis which includes 11 productions all around since 1987 so can you talk a little bit about your time with the Macintosh years and then a little bit with Les Mis starting with Broadway and then how you branched out to kind of um, follow well, that thing about the Macintosh years it included you know song and dance Oliver with Patti Lapone and Ron Moody uh, Song and Dance with Bernadette Peters, um, Les Miserables, The Phantom of the Opera, Miss Saigon, Five Guys Named Mo, and putting it together, the Julie Andrews production at Manhattan Theater Club. And so, and that was a big block of like 13 years of my life, living on planes, doing different productions. But the thing about Les Mis that was sort of miraculous is when I was, I was the dance captain and second ASM of Oliver at the Mark Hellinger. And I met Cameron McIntosh, who was producing it. And um, he told me he was going to do this musical version of Les Miserables. I'd never read Les Miserables. You know, I knew The Hunchback of Notre Dame was the only Victor Hugo I knew. So uh, I went to the Coliseum Books. There used to be a place called Coliseum Books up on Columbus Circle. And I bought the novel. And it was like this fat. And I'm like, oh, my God, who wants a job this bad? And I'm not a particularly speedy reader. So I'm down in Santiago, Chile, my first night. And I'm depressed. And I'm like, why did I take this job? What am I doing? Wrong? And I start reading the book. And I'm not a particularly quick reader, but I was devouring it. And by the time I came to the ABC Cafe, I was mental. And I called London. London was open with the time difference. And I said, Cameron, who's going to direct this? And he goes, well, I've asked Trevor Nunn and John Caird. And I said, oh, I met them once. When I was doing Amadeus, they were doing Nicholas Nickleby next door. Can you get me a meeting? So he did. And I flew over. And Trevor Nunn was out of town. And John Caird was there. And I think he patted me on the head and thought, oh, you sweet little musical theater boy. And I'm like, you didn't tell him you're trained, you're Shakespeare, you're Ibsen, you're Shaw. But they were interested enough that they were snooping around Broadway about me. I would bump into Nell Nugent or the Schubert, Richard J. I got a phone call today. Everybody's asking about you, you know? So the production went on at the Royal Shakespeare Company. It didn't get great reviews, but Cameron was under pressure from Andrew Lloyd Webber whether or not to move it into the Palace Theater. And he did. And I flew over to see it and I couldn't breathe. Like, you know, I'm just like, getting a little teary remembering. I could not breathe at the end of act one. So I'm in the, they whisk you away to a little room with drinks and, and all that. And then I remember my meeting with Trevor and John and Joe Allen. And uh, I said, God, stars is in the wrong place. You're stopping the story of that stupid girl song. The girl sings, I saw him once that's gotta go. I'm like all of, you know, what, however old I am 32 or whatever. And I'm telling them what's wrong with it. Not a great way to get a job, but anyway, they said, you'll be our assistant. And I said, oh no, I'm not an assistant anything. You know, I'm, I have to be an associate because I already did the assistant thing on Amadeus and I never saw Sir Peter Hall again because he was running the National Theater of Great Britain. You guys are running the Royal Shakespeare Company. So, you know, let's make a deal. And we did. And um, all those companies later and, you know, the thing about, you know, long run shows and multiple companies is it's its own microcosm. It's births, deaths, marriages, divorces, AIDS happen. 
there are so many things going on simultaneously. What's really interesting about the women is in the women's dressing room, everybody goes in there on their own cycle of having their periods and everybody gets on the same period cycle. Can you believe that? This is a fact. You can ask anybody in a long run show. Everybody gets their period at the same time, which makes it tough for the swings. It's really the headaches, like the whole thing, but it's a phenomenon. By living together, working together, eight shows a week, everybody gets on the same cycle. It's unbelievable, you know? So stuff like that, you know, I call it Broadway phenomena, you know, uh, trivia, but, um, uh, you know, and then just all when AIDS happened and Broadway Cares was born and I've been a board member, you know, but to have Les Mis, Phantom and Saigon, bam, 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 you know, one, two, three in consecutive years, it was a lot, a lot of time on planes, you know, you lose a lot of your life, but I wouldn't change any of it, you know, and, uh, you know, and, you know, you try to be apolitical in the theater, but the politics will kill you, you know what I mean? And I was a moving target, you know, because I was second in command. I was not Cameron, I was Richard. I was not Trevor and John, I was Richard. So you're just one rung under and you become a moving target. And that was fascinating. Yeah, that's great. So you've touched on this a bit already, um, but you've had extensive experience working with Barbara Streisand. You've direct her film. 20 project. years, it's our 20 year anniversary. Can you- 20 believe? year anniversary, well, congratulations. I know, <laughs> I've loved her since I was 10 years old. So that's a pretty big one on the list. Yeah, what a dream. So how has it been, you know, working with a woman with like such a claim for 20 years? It's been great. You know, you're not supposed to have favorites, but she's my favorite, hands down. And I'd lay in front of a bus for her, but <laughs> she's so smart and so dazzling to look at and the blue eyes and you know, all the movies that you saw her in, you know, like just, and you're just looking, look, I don't know. We just get along really, really well. We write together, we work together, we rehearse together, we sing together, we're on the stage together. Um, and we've created a lot of great stuff, you know? So, and her manager, Marty Ehrlichman, who's been with her her whole career, you know, he trusted me with her, which is a big deal. And her husband trusts me with her and uh, my writing partner and uh, her uh, A&R record guy, Jay Landers, who's the guy that recommended to her that she meet me, you know, face to face back in 93. Because um, I met her in the 80s when I was doing Amadeus because Amy Irving was in Yentl. But Amy Irving had turned down the audition and came to work one night. She replaced Jane Seymour. She goes, I turned down some Jewish thing. I go, what Jewish thing? And she told me, I go, you get up there and you read. And you go up to Barbara's apartment. And, and anyway, she got the part. So Barbara invited us to dinner. She came to see the show. And I remember I was like, I don't think I said one word. I was just like, <laughs> later I got my brain cells, you know, by 1993. And, uh, you know, and then it's, you know, it's daunting. It's like, I hope you have ideas. Yeah, I do too. But, you know, you might send me home with my ass in a basket, but it worked out, you know, it just, you know, and she gets me and God knows I get her. And, you know, sometimes you just cry or, you know, you just melt in rehearsal, like just something will flick the switch and, you know, you're just a mess, you know? And so... Um, it, it's amazing, you know, traveling together, sightseeing together, eating together, shopping together. It's a blast, you know, and you never want to be the best friend, you know, because you have to be effective. You know what I'm saying? You still got to go to work and you got to be Richard J. And, uh, but we are, uh, we are fantastic co-directors together and we're great boxing partners. That's amazing. Truly amazing. Um, you like her? A lot of kids your age don't even know who she is. We love Not her. Not at all. <laughs> they go like this, oh, Mrs. Fokker sings. I'm like, I can't talk to you. <laughs> and I, I, I was seeing somebody once that came to my house and I have a picture from when I did putting it together of Stephen Sondheim and Julie Andrews on a little table with a Tiffany lamp. And the kid goes like this, are those your parents? And I go, you gotta leave. Like you gotta <laughs> leave like right now, you have to leave my home. <laughs> true story. Can you imagine? You should have just Can said you even that. imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those are my parents. <laughs> yeah, I, I, could, I should have said that, but I'm just like, oh my God, I can't even talk to you. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, in a similar vein, you've done a lot of work and you mentioned this in the beginning that you're now sort of deemed the, the diva whisperer. So that includes a lot of work with Kristen Chenoweth, Bernadette Peters, their concerts, Broadway engagements. So what is it like directing these, you know, acclaimed stars in these sort of, um, you know, concert engagements? And, you know, what are the rewards and challenges associated? It's fantastic. With it's tricky. It's difficult. 
Um, and um, it's dramatic because it always happens in a night. So you're one night at Carnegie Hall. It's not like you get another chance, you know, and you're going to record the album and the critics are coming. It's a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? Or like when Kristen asked me to work with her, she goes, would you ever consider working with me? And I said, sure. And she goes, well, I thought you weren't available. I said, you never asked. It's funny sure. how you know each other, but you don't really know each other, you know, when you're first doing the dance. Now, Bernadette and I knew each other since Song and Dance. And then when she got the opportunity to do Carnegie Hall, she said, I'm not doing it without you. But it, it's dangerous, you know, and then that's when she came up with the idea of doing all Sondheim second half. And then I thought we'll revisit the career in the first half, but she didn't want to do Dames at Sea. She didn't want to do Mac and Mabel. And I said, then you got the wrong guy because this audience, you know, you, I know you've been on this stage before, but you haven't had a solo concert and you can't decide when they fell in love with you, whether it was Dames at Sea, whether it was Mac and Mabel, whether it was Goodbye Girl, whatever. And anyway, we had a triumph and that night, the Carnegie Hall night changed my entire life. In one night, my life changed. Um, and, you know, that was the beginning of, you know, being identified with these superstar concerts, you know, doing Leia Salonga, Brian Stokes Mitchell, all Carnegie Hall debuts, solo debuts. Um, Norm Lewis, when we started working together, Norm would, I'm not going to say argue with me, but we'd have some healthy discussions and go, Norm, have you ever been reviewed as a solo artist by the New York Times? He goes, no. I said, then we're going to do it my way and you're going to listen. It wasn't like an attitude or anything like that. We were being humorous about it, but I sort of know what I'm doing now. So if you hired me and I'm here, you know, what am I doing here? Like, if you know what you want, go get a stage manager or an event planner. I'm a real director. So I mine things, you know what I mean? A particular interest was when Bernadette would fight about the end of act one. Um, she didn't want to do some people, but I said, Bernadette, you have nothing in your career that I can close the act with. Nothing. You know what I mean? So I want this. And I listened to everybody. I listened to the Merm, Rosalind Russell, Bette Midler. I listened to everybody and nobody was like, you know, and so we fought, you know, she told me she was scared of it. She cried, came over to Sardi's, we ate. And she's like, what if people don't think I can play this role? I want to play it one day. And I said, well, I don't live at that address. Richard J is famous for a lot of shit coming out of his mouth. And I don't know where it comes from. It's not premeditated, but that phrase was born that evening at dinner. I don't live at that address, which the address would be fear because fear is crippling. Well, we did it. It closed act one. We got a standing ovation. And that night, Stephen Sondheim and Arthur Lawrence offered her Gypsy on Broadway. Wow. So when he said it in the article in the Times, I didn't call Bernadette and go like, nya, 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 you know, <laughs> but it was there in writing. And I was so grateful that he said it, you know, now that's not why we did it to get Gypsy, but this was something she had on her list of things to do because everybody's like, oh, Bernadette, she's so cute. Give, give, give. And it was time to take. And so I worked on aggression, the aggression of the walking, of the drive, of the, you know, and, you know, I thought she would be fearful of it because she and her sister were in the business and the mother dragged them through. And I thought that was what might be going on, but it wasn't, it was just plain old fear. Bette Midler coming in on the horse, same thing. You know, I'm not coming in on that horse, you know, oh, I get a body double. I'm like, great. You get in the audience and sing, I'll get on the horse, you watch. And then of course you see that it works. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not, nobody's difficult. Everybody's like freaked out. You know, there's a lot riding on this, no pun intended, you know? So I get it, but having been a performer, you know, I understand the insecurities and all that. And um, uh, I don't know, you know, it's, it has worked out. You know, it has really worked out and we've had success. Read those reviews for um, uh, the Kiss My Brass tour. They're astonishing, you know, the Barbara Streisand tours. Now you could also be wrong. Like I'm gonna be hit by a car someday soon because you know, the track record is too good, but um, <laughs> I enjoy it. And also like there's baby Dickie in me. And so when you're watching the show for the first time, because I need rehearsal too. So I'm watching it with an audience. And I, as you're rehearsing a show without an audience, I'm the audience. And so I've got the temperature and I'm a good audience member. I'm a punter like that with the public. <clears throat> and so Norm Lewis says, I know what people want. I don't know if that's a fact, but I sense it. And when you're right, it sure feels good. You don't boast about it, but you have a little victory in your body, like because you're tense. Will the joke work? Will it land? Does it have syntax? Is the rhythm right? You know, because everybody speaks in different rhythm. Barbara's got a Brooklyn vibe. Bernadette has, you know, Queen. That's got a rat tat tat tat. And you write for that person's, you know, 
the movement of you know the way they make words so it's it's not scientific it's very natural but i've learned to be truthful and i learned that lesson from bernadette and then if they don't like your truth then who cares you know fuck them you know you can't worry about that because if you are truthful but i'm not into trickery and go girl and like all that shit i don't do any of that crap i don't do fag hag shows you know i do world class shows and i'm very proud of that yeah. just going off of that what would you say uh you know makes directing a large scale concert you've done gala different from uh, a musical like Les Mis? Well, they're different. One has a total structure that you got to deliver. You know, one was directed by two geniuses that you're interpreting. But the great thing about doing the long run shows is that people are good at different things. So some Tenardiers are funnier, some are darker. So when you find an actor with gifts, you mine that particular color of what it is they do. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll never forget Melissa Errico when I took her out of her freshman year at Yale and she joined the tour of Les Mis just the abandon and her notebook and her studiousness and the way she threw herself at Valjean's feet in the last scene in the wedding dress. I just never saw anything like it, but it became my template. Watching Ricky Martin walk into Paris, you know, and remembering that Victor Hugo said, you could put a potato sack on this boy, you would still understand that he was bred on the other side of the tracks, you know, which is why he can't possibly be with Ebony. And Ricky would walk in and with the Andrian and Nia Fitu costumes, which helped the situation, and he changed the way I looked at Marius forever for the rest of my life. So different people bring different things. Hugh Panero, the different Valjeans, you know, the fathers, the one beats, the, you know, the people, you know, everybody came to auditions trying to imitate Francis Raphael on the album. <laughs> you know, making all those noises. Those were natural to Francis. What does your voice sound like, you know? And then also, once you get through a whole population base, you have to start training people. I went to Nashville, I went to Disney World, I found people all over the place. I found Sarah Uriarty in the pores of Cabaret because I want to see my friend Sam Harris at Sacramento Music Circus. I brought people to New York that probably never would have come here, you know? So it's interesting, but the bigger question of what you're saying is, you know, what I find is whether you're a cabaret act at Feinstein's, right? Or a big concert, the work is identical. It doesn't matter whether it's for 119 people or, you know, 15,000, it's still hair raising and the process is the same. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Richard, where were you, you know, right before COVID hit? I mean, obviously you're super busy and, uh, uh, you know, working consistently. So, you know, where did it fall in your schedule and what have you been up to since? Well, COVID, um, I think I got it in December after Kristen's Broadway show and Norm's Christmas show. I came home to Florida and I was so sick for 26 days. So was Kristen, so was my assistant. We were all sick with the exact same. Kristen was on vacation. We're all, you know, doing all kinds of terrible things with our bodies that are going on. And then by the time the antibody test came, like in March or April, of course, the antibodies were gone. So I just had my first half of the vaccine, but um, I had just finished For the Girls on Broadway and Norm's Christmas show. And I was working with Deborah Cox because we were going to start doing concert work. And then things started getting canceled. And I was doing Kristen Chenoweth's Broadway boot camp last summer. And about, I guess, March ish, we called it off. They went ahead and had the auditions, but uh, we called camp off. So this year we're going to do camp virtually, which I think is going to be pretty great. We have a lot of great people. Um, uh, and also we can have students in Bangkok, you know what I mean? It's going to be wild. So, um, but um, it's weird. I'm a people person, no lie. I love hugging and I love socializing and I'm a party guy and I love singing and we need the droplets. Like if you watched, uh, you watched um, Disney um, uh, Hamilton, right? On Disney plus, Jonathan Groff spitting up a storm. You know what I mean? He's the spitter, you know, he's a wet, wet, wet singer. I never realized it till I saw Little Shop how wet he sings because in the Broadway production of Hamilton, the way the walls of light are, you never saw the spittle. You know what I mean? At the West Side Arch, you could see it. But there he is spouting away. And I wrote to him and I said, Jonathan, you can spit on me anytime you want. Like, but yeah. it's the air, like no matter how high you turn up the volume on your stereo, there's nothing like the, the room, the molecules floating that make your hair stand up on your arm. You know what I mean? And so um, I just did a Christmas show with Deborah Cox. We did it, it was safe. It was on the stage at the Arsh Center here in Miami. And on the day of the rehearsal with the band in the room, I started to go down to the stage front and uh, I was choked. My throat had locked and I couldn't get, and she moved me so much because I hadn't been on a stage in a year. 
you know, or around a live performer. And it really got to me. It really got to me. So I sort of can't wait. And I cried the other day. What was I doing? I was doing an interview for something. Um, and I just burst into tears because I can't imagine the first time that I'm able to go to a theater and the lights go down and the curtain goes up. I'm going to be a fucking mess, <laughs> you know, because it's just, it's going to be too much. It's been so long. I mean, you're talking to somebody who goes to Broadway, you know, 50 shows a year, you know, so, or touring companies or, you know, whatever comes here to Miami or whatever nightclub acts, but, you know, I'm out six nights a week in real life and that's not happening. And I, I just can't zoom myself to hell and I can't sit and watch these things for 18 hours that everybody watches on the couch. It kills me. So I go to the ocean and, you know, I take dance class online. Sierra Boggess is just a big inspiration to me because she's always, now she's ice skating. Like she kills me. She's the most <laughs> perfect girl ever. Like I love Sierra. And I'm just like, you're so perfect. Like, you know, she can do everything. Now she's ice skating and twirling, you know, on Facebook. So anyway, so, uh, you know, I do a lot. I shouldn't be, I'm not doing the things I should be doing. Like I'm looking at this pile of papers. They've been there since last March. When am I going to clean my desk? I have no idea, you know? <laughs> so I do stupid things and I daydream and I read and, you know, listen to music and, you know, sleep and walk my dog and that's it. And I eat, I eat a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so just, Talking about, you know, the industry going forward, what advice do you have for young artists during this time on staying creative and what advice do you have for them just going forward into this yeah, business? It's a very interesting question and I'll be very honest with you. Anybody who gives advice is full of shit, you know, because there is none to give. If you want it, nothing's going to get in your way. You know, you're going to put your ears and eyes to the ground. You're going to listen. You're going to find your tribe you're going to help each other. You know, you're going to go to New York together. Or you're going to go to LA together or whatever. Nobody's handing out anything. And with the internet and song contests and it's a shit show. Do you know what I'm saying? But I do believe in training. And like, I didn't go to a big school. I went to a state school. So I had to compete with Yale and Carnegie Mellon and all that. But guess what? I've got a great career. So it's what you do with your education. But it's really about friendships, hearing, you know, learning because, no school can really prepare you unless you're at a professional school where, you know, they have the showcases, the agents come, like where it's all sort of designed for you. And then, of course, that's a terror because if you're not the kid that gets picked by an agent, when you go do showcase in New York, what do you do? Commit suicide, you know? So it's brutal. But the great thing about what is happening now is that there is no type anymore. You can be anybody and have a career. You can be any shape, any race, any creed, you know, any persuasion and have a career. It's just what, like, I've known Billy Porter my whole career. It happened, look how long it took to happen. Rosie O'Donnell used to say he needs to be a big star, but it took landing that pose. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's the thing. Look at the guy in Bridgerton. Do you guys watch Bridgerton? Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it yet. I have to catch up. So anyway, he's fantastic, but he's been around. He was on a series with on one of Shonda's shows for two seasons. He's in uh, Sylvie's um, uh, Love, uh, but he just found the right part, you know, at the right time. And then all the people that thought it was racist to have all those Black people in the court of that time, I'm like, you know, it's crazy. Don't go to Shakespeare in the park. Like, well, what the hell is going on with you? But name me a white guy that could play that part. You want Brad Pitt? I don't think so. That guy was perfect. So when you find it, but it's all about finding your tribe and finding the person that's going to take a risk. I've thrown my balls down many times for going, I want that. Or I'll be at the Hollywood Bowl and they'll go, can't you get a bigger star? Like when I wanted Ken Page for Guys and Dolls as um, Nicely Nicely. And um, uh, they said, can't you? I said, yeah, I can get John Goodman, but he's not going to stop the show. So can I cast the show that I'm the director of? Or do you want to cast it and tell me when rehearsal starts? And so I'm, I play that game now. Like, did you hire me or did you hire my phone book? You know what I'm saying? So it's interesting, you know, in stars, like LA is a disease. You got to put people's TV shows after their name because nobody knows, um, you know, who they are. Oh, they were in that. Oh, that'll make me go see that live show. I don't think so. You know, it's a craft, you know, Leah Michelle is a great story. You know, I discovered her when she was eight. And she stayed in the business and stage door manor. And then she was in ragtime, all that. <clears throat> but her story, by the time she got into Spring Awakening and was about 16 or 17, 
Um, when I went to see the show, it was crazy because her little titty pops out of the dress when Jonathan's I'm like, oh my God, that's my child. Like, I can't. <laughs> you know? And I did a very famous interview that's on the internet. It's been seen by millions of people. And in that interview, I interviewed her because I was pissed because she didn't get nominated for a Tony. And, um, and she goes, you know, Richard J., I, I still want to play Eponine and Les Mis, you know, now that I'm 17 or something, now I'm growing up because she was a little Cosette. And I said, you know what, you're probably not out of chances. And it was like days later that I got the offer from the Hollywood Bowl. And I called her up and I go, you want to come play Eponine in LA? And the rest is history. And, you know, there's Ryan Murphy. And then she goes and auditions at 20th Century Fox and Glee happens. You know, the day, do you know what happened the day she had her audition? No. She had a car accident in front of 20th Century Fox. And there's glass in her hair. And she left the smoking car there and went in and auditioned and got the part. Like she was hitting glass out of her hair. <laughs> wow. Oh my great. God. It's a great story. It's <laughs> crazy. So what is your favorite show or concert that you've done? Um, you've already told us who, you know, one of your favorite people to work with are, but do you have a favorite show or concert you've done? Well, Les Mis would have to be my baby, you know, because I was just so invested in it. It was the first time I really had the responsibility it was like, I am Les Mis, you know what I mean? It's such a crazy thing to say, but it's true. Like, I feel like that. And um, and then in concert, I just, my heart goes to Bernadette Peters. And when I listen to the Carnegie Hall album, you know, I'm just like, I can't even believe I did that. You know what I mean? And, but that changed my life. So I would have to say, you know, and I love all my Norm stuff and I love the Kristen Chenoweth stuff and I love the PBS and I love Il Bolo and I love, you know, I love, I love them all, you know, but um, my pangs, my heart goes to those because they just, they were moments in time that changed everything. Like Les Mis changed my whole career, the way people saw me, the kind of offers I got, you know, it was interesting. Yeah. So going off of that, you've shared some amazing stories with us today, but is there a favorite story that you just love to tell that you haven't gotten to tell today? Not really. It's so funny. I don't tell story. Well, I guess they are stories. I'm just telling you <laughs> facts, really. But uh, I will tell you one funny thing. Is this the closer? Are we closing? Yeah. We are. Okay. Because this is my favorite thing to do to students. So when I go speak at colleges or whatever, um, I was just looking for something to show you. Oh, I can show you this. Hold on. I knew it was within arm's reach. I just didn't know where it was. So when I say I am Les Mis, look at this. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was gifted to me. It's funny, right? That is amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> but, and framed at Triton Galleries on Broadway. Look at that. Um, oh. But I always, um, uh, I always say that they'll go like this. Do you have any parting thought, any parting words? And I go like this. Yes. Oh God. Yes. 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 Always, always, always moisturize your neck because one day it might be part of your face. Wise words. Wise Do you get that? Like you see the people where their neck is actually part of their face now as they get older, but the skin doesn't match because they never moisturized. <laughs> so, and they scream, I go, you can steal it. Go ahead and steal it. But yeah, no, there's no story. You know, stories come up from, you know, like getting your memory jogged, you know, like I'm looking at my wall here. There I am with Ian McKellen, Bernadette Peters, Ricky Martin. They're all moments in time, but if you knew how I grew up and how I was made fun of, you know, there were no words like bullying. It was just mean. You know what I mean? And I kept saying, I'm going to New York. I'm going to be on Broadway. And, you know, it was terrible. It was terrible growing up. Terrible. But you find your tribe. That's my advice to everybody. Like you guys are friends. You're going to stick together. And it's going to happen. If you want it, it's going to happen. There's no easy way. If you give up or, you know, a lot of the girls, including my niece, you know, I'm going to give it five years. And if not, I'm going to get married and move to Connecticut. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that because the years fly. You know what I mean? Even this year of COVID has flown. Like it's going to be a year in March, you know, and I can't really tell you what I've done. I mean, I can really, and I've been busy and I've been productive, but somehow it doesn't seem like enough. Like, you know, I still haven't like rehung my clothes in the closet. Why is that? 
I guess, because it's not really that important. You know what I mean? Like I want to go to my storage unit. I want to redo my will, you know? If I don't like photograph everything that's in this house and I die, my brother will sell everything for 75 cents at a garage sale. And there's some very valuable things here. So I've got to get busy. I got to get really, really, really busy. Absolutely. Well, congratulations on your truly incredible and ever growing career. We're super thrilled to have. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. You guys are very sweet. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And we'll stay in touch for sure. Okay, thanks. Peace out.